Welcome to Citizens Climate Lobby's October meeting. I'm Ellie Sparks and I'm a member of CCL staff. Thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You can let us know where you're joining from. If you're in a room with others, tell us how many people are in the room with you. I love seeing Richmond, Virginia with five in the room or Duluth, Minnesota with 12 in the room. So introduce yourself or your chapter in the chat and also use the link that we've just put in the chat to log your attendance today so we know that you are officially here. So now let's get started. Here at CCL, we're a nonpartisan grassroots climate organization. Our local chapters are filled with regular folks, just like you, who are discovering their political power and lobbying Congress for big, effective policies to address climate change. And we're doing it together. Whether you're liberal or conservative, or your Congress people are Republicans or Democrats, you are welcome here. We're all making connections in our communities and building bridges in DC so we can solve this big problem together. I'm so glad you're here with us for our October meeting. Today, we've included a volunteer Q&A portion of the call where we dig into a question about growing your chapter and we'll get some insights and advice from group leader, Debbie Chang. We'll go over our actions for the upcoming month and then we'll spend most of our time on a legislative deep dive with our Vice President of Government Affairs, Ben Pendergrass. And we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions of Ben. We want to make sure that we're all up to speed with what's happening in Congress and ready for our November lobbying coming up in just a few weeks. Before all of that, let's celebrate some of our recent successes. Please feel free to share any CCL personal wins or chapter successes in the chat. I'm gonna ask Flannery to read those comments aloud after I've shared some of the carbon pricing successes we've seen here at home and around the world. And then also remind you about two upcoming special CCL events. So first of all, the European Union's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, has entered its next phase, the reporting phase. Countries who want to trade with Europe must now report the greenhouse gas emissions related to their exports of iron, steel, cement, fertilizer, electricity, all sorts of stuff. And after a few years of this reporting phase, the CBAM will go into full effect in 2026. One EU official explained it like this. If you come with dirty products on our market, you have to pay the price. But we prefer, prefer you keep the money in your economy by putting a price on carbon in your economy. So this policy encourages other countries, including the US, to put their own price on carbon. Very exciting. Another encouraging signal came out of the Africa Climate Summit in mid-September. The summit ended with a call for world leaders to rally around a global carbon tax, and African leaders unanimously adopted this declaration. <clears throat> and of course, carbon pricing has taken a big step forward here at home with the reintroduction of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. How wonderful to see more than 500 of you listening live to our volunteer call to celebrate that news. And we'll hear more on that bill from Ben shortly. I also wanna give you a quick shout out about conference activities. We recently had our second annual inclusion conference, which took place a few weeks ago. We've had several regional conferences, including the Great Lakes, North Wind and Third Coast regions. These were all well attended and it's clear that you, all, you are all out there fired up and ready to go. Now coming up in the next few weeks, we have some other special events and I'm gonna tell you about one of them. It is a meeting with our diversity and inclusion action team where Drew, our conservative outreach director and Karina, our diversity and inclusion director, will host a joint discussion about political diversity and what that means for us at CCL. This is a really unique event because we're one of the only organizations approaching climate advocacy work in this way. 
We're bringing people together across political divides to make change together. Drew and Karina are going to discuss political diversity on the evening of October 23rd, and I'm personally inviting all of you to attend, and the link for that event is in the chat. We also have our virtual fall conference coming up on Saturday, November 4th. The fall conference will take the place of our usual monthly meeting for November, so definitely plan on joining us for the fall conference on Saturday, November 4th, and we'll talk a bit more about the conference in a few moments. So Flannery, do you have any highlights that you could share for us? Yes, so a couple folks have chatted some highlights from their month. So Cody shared our chapter had an electrification fair. They brought together vendors who offer electrification and efficiency services, and they showcased how to pay for those services um, through the Inflation Reduction Act and state programs and local rebates. So that's some cool education going on. Thank you, Cody, for sharing that. Um, and the Marquette chapter of CCL said we just had a great lobby meeting with a state elected official. So awesome stuff happening out there in the field. Awesome. Thank you, Flannery. And feel free to continue putting things in the chat, how many are in your room with you, where your chapter is located, and tell us any more celebrations you want to add. Okay, so moving on. CCL's community forums are a great place to post questions. I know you all know that and chat with other volunteers and CCL staff about the work that we're all doing. Volunteer Sarah M. posted in our group leader forum after attending the conference and lobbying on Capitol Hill earlier this year. And she said, our chapter is about four, yes, you read that right, four active members strong. Three of us just returned from in-person lobbying. And for two of us, including myself, it was our first time. We are definitely satisfied with the experience. But I also find myself overwhelmed and not sure where to begin to help our small chapter grow and do more. Sarah went on to say that they are struggling to get people to show up and come back, which is a common challenge. And she asked for guidance and experiences related to welcoming new people and setting realistic goals as a small chapter. Now, there was a great conversation in the forum with other group leaders jumping in to offer advice, including Debbie Chang, who is the group leader of CCL Huntsville in Alabama. And Debbie is here with us to share some of the advice she gave when answering Sarah's question. So, Debbie, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Debbie Chang. And almost a year ago, I moved from being a co-leader of a large liberal metropolitan area to a sole leader, leader of a chap elapsed chapter in a mostly conservative suburb in a very conservative state. Um, since I joined CCL six years ago, the political lever of CCL that I've been most interested in is chapter and member development. Um, they were good skills to build on that I'm actively using now to kickstart this new chapter. Um, the best skill that I can share with all of you is to have grace for yourself and for the volunteers around you. When I restarted the new chapter, I reached out to advice for uh, most, whatever, what is the most important thing with Allie and Brett and my therapist, they all independently said the most important thing was to give myself grace. I have some climate FOMO. Some of you probably do too, fear of missing out. I wanna sign up for everything and do everything and solve everything. And it's really, really hard to control and limit myself to only what I have the capacity for. It's helpful sometimes for me to think about role modeling this for other newer volunteers, um, that it's okay to do what you're able to. And like my therapist says, not even the president can do everything that he wants to do, right? So the advantage to this grace for your capacity is that it's more sustainable as a volunteer to do a couple of things well, and it creates more sustainable change if your chapter is able to keep up a persistent climate effort with your legislator. So keeping that in mind, take what serves you here and leaves the, leave the rest. So this is some of what I priority, prioritize. The one consistent thing, what's your one consistent thing? The primary thing that I'm committed to as a chapter leader is making sure we have a meeting every month that people can attend and that everyone knows about it. So it means like communicating the meeting through all the regular channels and with occasional bonus contacts, like e either email, text, or phone um, a day or two ahead of time. So that's all I'm doing. Any other efforts can wait for others to step up. Now, if you're not a chapter leader, what can you do that's sustainable for you? 
Maybe it's holding a letter to the editor writing party each month. Maybe it's reading the weekly briefings for an idea that you want to make happen in your chapter. Maybe it's just doing that monthly action that CCL emails you or showing up to the meeting to lend your enthusiastic support. That's it. Great. Consistency, persistence is really critical to the long-term um, effects of your efforts. Connecting with new joiners, your new members who show up to, on, um, at your meeting or on your roster for the first or second time, they're your best prospects for volunteers. This is probably one of the most important things to do for any chapter. Um, I use the welcome call form that's on the onboarding action team. Shout out onboarding action team. Awesome. Um, if you're a veteran volunteer, make it a point to reach out to a newer member at a rate that's sustainable for you. Um, if you're a newer volunteer, help us veterans out. We're all volunteers. Reach out to a leader to express interest in something or even just socially. Um, and remember, People come to CCL for the climate cause and they stay for you and the community that you help create. Um, taking action in the meeting, each monthly chapter meeting agenda includes a collective action, preferably contacting a legislator. You can find those in the monthly action sheets. I try to give five minutes of quiet time during the meeting itself so that we do it right then. And that efficacy and tangible action helps keep people coming back. And last, sharing gratitude. At the end of each monthly meeting, our chapter members like to give recognitions and share gratitudes. So here's an example. Sarah Mason, you're awesome for asking this question and starting this conversation. I'm so glad that you asked it. I know other people have the same question. So thank you for doing that. Um, and then we open the floor up and popcorn style and ask everyone to, to, do, to chime in. And the reason that we do this is that we show people that their contributions, large and small, um, even one that you might take for granted, they're appreciated, they're noticed, please keep doing it. And I have noticed that this practice really helps change the chapter, um, the culture of my chapter after we started it. So shout out to the awesome community in my chapters listening in. And for all of you out there in CCL land, I'm so glad and grateful to be in this movement with you. Mm, thank you, Debbie. That was so wonderful. And I did see your chapter. It says Debbie's chapter. <laughs> they are here listening. That is so beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful advice. I really appreciate you coming on to share that with everyone. All right, so remember we found that, Debbie found that question in the forum. The forums is a great place for you to bring your questions and help answer others' questions. So keep, keep uh, the forums in mind and post your questions there and share your advice. All right, so speaking of things that you can find on CCL Community, our monthly action sheet. So let's take a look now at the actions we recommend for October. So first action is to register for our fall conference. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the call, this is a free virtual conference. We're calling it Grassroots Rising, and it's happening on Saturday, November 4th, and there are other programming that happens also on Sunday. The program will dive into different ways that we can level up our advocacy to meet the increasing pace of climate change. Now, you're not going to want to miss our keynote speakers. We have Van Jones, who you've probably seen in his role as a CNN commentator, and Danny Richter, who you've also seen around CCL for years as our former Vice President of Government Affairs. We've got plenty of volunteer-led breakout sessions where you can learn from each other on community outreach, coalition building, creative ways to interact with your members of Congress, and all sorts of good stuff. And we hope your chapter might consider hosting a watch party so you can join together in person with each other to attend the virtual conference. We'll drop a link in the chat where you can register Again, it's free virtual event, Saturday, November 4th, and we hope you will join us there. Another action you can take in the coming weeks is to plan for your November 6th through 10th lobby meetings. Now we usually pair our conferences with lobbying. So when we're in DC in June, we have our conference days and then we go lobby on Capitol Hill. When we uh, have our conference in the fall, we also then lobby virtually in the fall. So get with your congressional liaisons to plan those meetings. And Ben is going to touch on this a bit more in his legislative update in just a minute. All right, another action you can work on is educating people about the Energy Innovation Act and building support in your communities. 
Our action sheet this month has lots of suggestions on how to do this and new resources that you can use. One idea is to schedule some tabling events and get folks to fill out our updated constituent letter form. So people in your district can write a personalized letter to their representative asking for their support. We also have a variety of tabling materials about the Energy Innovation Act, all linked from the action sheet for you. And another idea is to arrange presentations to other local organizations to educate them about the Energy Innovation Act. We have updated slides that you can use for those presentations and trainings about how to give a good presentation if you're new to that type of outreach. All of those resources and ideas are in the October action sheet. So take a look and jump in. All right, so now it's time for our legislative update where we're going to hear from Ben Pendergrass, CCL's Vice President of Government Affairs. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So please put your questions in the Zoom's Q&A feature. And just a little bit about Ben before he gets started. Ben has worked for over 14 years in Washington, both as congressional staff and as a government relations professional. For several years, he served on the legislative staff of a Republican senator. And before joining CCL staff, he was senior vice president for policy and legislative affairs for a national trade association. Ben has worked in a wide range of policy areas, including taxes, natural resources, agriculture, and natural national security. So we're super lucky to have Ben as our Vice President of Government Affairs, helping us navigate the complicated world of Congress. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Ellie. Um, my new update that Bob, I'm now getting old. It's been 20 years, as scary as that is for me. I know Ellie, Ellie promised you a deep dive, but we might, it might be more of a shallow wade, so we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So I just want to start off and talk a little bit about like what the heck is happening up here in Congress. Well, 15 days ago, contrary to what we thought might happen, everybody in DC was pretty sure we were going to have a government shutdown, but the government didn't. There was a bipartisan compromise to fund the government for 45 days. But the thing that did happen that we thought would happen um, if there was a bipartisan compromise is Kevin McCarthy lost his job as speaker. Right now, the House no longer has a speaker, and Republicans are having a really hard time um, coalescing around a candidate to replace uh, Kevin McCarthy. Um, right now, there's a, a couple nominees, Steve Scalise, that already dropped out after he won a, uh, a secret ballot last week. And right now, Jim Jordan is the speaker designee, um, but he still has to win a four vote, and it is not entirely clear he has the votes to become speaker. Now this really has an impact because government, the, the house cannot function without a speaker the way the rules are written. And so they have to get that done before they can take any legislative action. The other thing we know is there's there we're going to need a funding bill in 45 days. On November 17th, uh, funding lapses. And I think one thing that came out of the last couple of weeks is there's a pretty broad consensus that we do not want a government shut down, um, particularly around like issues with national security, with the Hamas attack on Israel. Um, both Republicans and Democrats want to find a way to fund the government, but we need a new Speaker of the House first. And all these things though are really going to have an impact on what Congress can accomplish this year. But we do think there's a room for an end of the year deal to get some things done. People want funding, emergency funding for Israel in light of the attack. They need to fund, provide assistance to Ukraine there might be a place for permitting reform in that deal. And that's what we're really going to be thinking about in the next couple of weeks. On the legislative side, like Ellie noted, the Energy Innovation Act was reintroduced, which is great. It's the first major carbon pricing bill to be introduced this Congress. And it's always an important step forward. You know, you guys made thousands of calls in the lead up to introduction of that bill to remind people of the importance of a carbon price. And have since made thousands more calls and emails to Congress reminding members that it's important. And you know, Congress really does need to hear from us on these issues when a bill like that is introduced, because if we're quiet, you know, they don't know that there's grassroots support for a carbon price. So we're fulfilling our role in making those calls. But one thing is this is a really a long-term project. And our focus for the Energy Innovation Act or any carbon pricing bill really needs to be 
on building that grassroots support in our communities. I really appreciate the things that Debbie said because that's where we can really have an impact right now when it comes to carbon pricing. We need to grow and strengthen and broaden those grassroots support for the policy, not necessarily be focused solely on Congress in advance in. Remember carbon price is a long game right now, but we also have to get climate wins uh, in the near term as well. And that's where I wanna talk about permanent reform. You know, permanent reform is a, a top priority because we know it's one of the biggest things we can get done now. We know it's vital to fully utilizing the victory of the IRA, and it will really be impactful when it comes to making a carbon price successful in the future when we do enact one. On that front, you might remember we've been we've been at the forefront of the carbon price or at the permanent reform conversation before a lot of folks were. In March, our conservative volunteers came to DC for a conservative conference and lobbied on permanent reform. A lot of those things ended up in the debt ceiling debt at the beginning, the debt ceiling deal at the beginning of the summer. And so it was impactful. Then we lobbied on permanent reform generally when everybody was here in June. And you might remember, as part of that, we made a ask grant transmission. We said Congress should consider giving FERC greater authority to permit, cite, and allocate costs for large scale transmission, or they should require that regions be able to transfer significant power between regions. Well, the bill that would do that last part was introduced in September and it's called Big Wires. It addresses the need for greater interregional transmission by requiring regions to be able to transfer up to 30% of peak demand between other regions. They would do this by creating new transmission lines that were upgrade existing facilities, use grid enhancing technology such as advanced power flow controls or dynamic line ratings, find new ways to be energy efficient and reduce pink demand or create new generation or storage that frees up, frees up capability to move power. You know, Dana is going to give a deep dive on this bill next Thursday the 19th to really get in the weeds of what it does. We have been working with Sarah Hinkenloper on this bill since spring. Back in June, we pushed permanent reform more broadly. Now we are going to get more specific and big wires will be our primary ask for both the House and the Senate in November. You know, we all prefer bipartisan bills. We don't always get them out of the gate, but this is a policy that really has bipartisan roots and we think we'll have traction with Republicans. You know, Jen and I will do a deep dive on the strategy and thinking around are both our primary ask and our secondary asks on October the 23rd and the 28th. And so hopefully you can join us then and then I will get really into the weeds on this stuff. Other things happening around permanent reform is another place we've been impactful was with the Climate Solutions Caucus. A, a couple of weeks ago, we helped the caucus organize their first briefing of the Congress and it was focused on permanent reform and our own Dana Nucitelli was actually one of the presenters in that briefing. And so stay tuned as well because the, the caucus is very interested in this issue. They see it as a priority. And so they will be releasing some actions on permitting reform in the very near future. So looking ahead and wanting to keep enough time for a bunch of questions, things in Congress are really uncertain right now. However, we do think there's an opportunity to get some stuff done in the coming months. And so our November lobby day is really well-timed and we'll be prepared to make our presence known on the Hill and have a really, really impactful lobby day. And with that, I'll take some questions. Awesome, thank you, Ben. A uh, lot going on. <laughs> Glad you had, had things to talk about this month. <laughs> Always. Um, all right, so our most upvoted question is from Linda asking, what do we need to do to get the Big Wires Act passed? Well, right now it was just introduced. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done. I mean, I have to give great credit to Senator Hinkenloper and Representative Peters. They've done a really good job of working behind the scenes to form a really broad coalition uh, in support of the bill. But we still, we now have to use our grassroots powers so that members of Congress hear from everyday citizens about the importance of this issue and the importance that permanent reform has a transmission component. And this will be really important the way we talk about it too, because this is a bill is important for grid reliability that has national security implications. There's a lot of good things like besides, you know, getting more transmission that helps us clean up the grid and get more clean energy to American households. Awesome. 
Um, all right. The our next question is from Carl. He's asking, can the House rules that prevent uh, bills being brought to the floor be changed? Are those limitations, those are not in the Constitution, right? Is that just a rule change that can happen? Well, I mean, I assume you're speaking of things like a discharge petition is one way that bills can be brought to the floor because the Speaker really does set the agenda for the House. That is the way it generally works. The Speaker brings bills to the floor. They have to go through a rules committee first to set a rule for debate. Um, those are all things that are done by the House, but you really need the only way traditionally bills come to the floor, and it happens almost never um, without the Speaker bringing it to the floor, is through a discharge petition, which means a, a majority of members of the House have to sign that. Um, and it's considered a uh, affront to leadership if you do that. That's why it's not normally used. But um, there's been quite a few affronts to leadership in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we really are in unprecedented territory and it is not clear yet what what the way out is. I mean, Republicans simply cannot coalesce around one candidate. And so that also leaves open the possibility of some sort of bipartisan deal, which is still not likely at this point. But if another speaker um, candidate was to fail on the floor next week, that could become a more likely possibility to get the House back open and operating. Interesting. Okay, we'll stay tuned to see how all that shakes out. Um, our next question is from Robert about permitting reform. Um, they say, I received a long articulate letter from Senator Booker about permitting reform. The environmental justice community is very skeptical about permitting reform. Uh, watching the presentation that Mr. That Dana Nucitelli did uh, included bringing communities into the process at the beginning. Uh, and so Robert's asking, how do we address the concerns of the EJ community on permitting reform? I think one of the things when we talk about permitting reform states, this is not about rubber stamping all projects. We really want to make sure that bad projects get canceled sooner and good projects get approved faster. Um, a, as, as Representative Peters has said, the second best answer to yes is no, just get in quickly. And, and that's what we want to make clear that it is not supposed to be a rubber stamp. And we also believe that you can improve the process where communities do have more engagement upfront and that can head off lawsuits because there's more dialogue and addressing of concerns. And so we want all these things um, in continuation. And the other thing that I think is really important to remember is, is study after study has shown that most projects now being held up are clean energy projects. Like they're not fossil fuel projects, they are clean energy projects. And that is slowing our effort to decarbonize and clean up the grid, grid and in other places. And, and that has health impacts as well. And those are the, the major points I think we need to continue to be making. And but we still just need to be sure and listen to people's concerns and find a way to um, get more clean energy up and running sooner. All right. Well, on that note about getting more clean energy up and running, um, I'm seeing a lot of questions about uh, about the Big Wires Act. So um, let me just pick a couple of those out. Um, so one was just asking, this is from Jack, just asking generally, does the Big Wires Act make it easier for new projects to connect to the grid? So maybe could you just give us a little sort of a high level, like what does the Big Wires Act do? Why are we so excited yeah, about it? So, and, and Dana will get into the very specifics of the bill next time. But the Big Wires, Big Wires Act, things it does is through, it gives regions a lot of leeway on how they accomplish the goals of the act. One of the problems with some of the other ways to address transmission was it took authority away from states and gave it all to FERC, which is good if you want more transmission, it can streamline the process, um, keep one state from holding it up. And, but this became politically much harder to, to get done after the, the fight over permanent reform in the last year's omnibus bill that was put forth by Senator Manchin. Big wires is, there's usually multiple solutions to a problem and big wires gets around this a little bit, but it still gives states and regions, you know, say over how to accomplish the goal. It sets the goal. If, you, if you're going to have to be able to transfer for 30% of power between regions, you're going to need more transmission but it gives them more options of how they accomplish that goal. And if we do do this, we will inevitably get much more transmission and much more green energy onto the grid. It's just a different way of accomplishing um, that goal to have greater build out of transmission. 
Gotcha. Okay. And then we have a question from Michael um, about how much would big wires on its own bend the U.S. Uh, emissions curve, which I'll forgive you if you don't have a specific percentage right off the top of your head. This is this is hard stuff. But and, and I'm sure Dana will answer that. I was going to uh, say, Dana, are you watching? Do you have a chart ready <laughs> for next week? That's and we know we know it's all part of the big picture. I mean, everybody's seen the chart, I hope, of a carbon price and permitting reform. Um, those big chunks of emissions reductions, we know transmission is a big part of that. Um, you know, we can't hit those numbers if it takes 10 years to approve and permit a transmission line and big wires will speed that up. So you have to think of it as being part of that big wedge that permitting reform does, if not all of it, a big part of it. Totally. All right, well, now let's pivot a little bit. Um, our next most upvoted question is from Karen asking about the EU CBAM. So uh, they're asking, do we know why the EU is taking two years for the reporting phase um, before enacting the actual CBAM? Now, this is all, you know, this lead up, they want to have the information first. They want to give companies a lead to, you know, see how the CBAM will impact them so they can change their behavior in advance of um, the CBAM actually going into effect. And so it's really like it is, is a necessary um, window. They had pushed it back a little bit. It was supposed to be um, a little sooner, and this is just part of their process. Um, instead of just implementing it immediately, now people will have two years to see what their emissions are, what the impact of the fee would be on their, their business, and then they can be prepared when it goes into effect in the next couple of years. Gotcha. Um, well, we also have a question uh, from Mike about the Prove-It Act. So um, can you talk about, Mike is asking, anything new with the Prove-It Act, any hope for a House version, but maybe you can also talk about um, what the Prove-It Act would do here at home and how that relates to the EU. Yeah, stuff. no, the Prove-It Act is, is, is a great step forward because it is calling for a DOA study into our emissions from our industry as well as our foreign competitors. And the thing is that we'll show that American industry is much cleaner than China, Russia, India, some of the bigger polluters, and that they are probably at a competitive disadvantage uh, for that reason, because they are taking the time and cost to decarbonize faster, and these other countries shouldn't have a competitive advantage. And great news, it's going to prove it act, is last week or the week before, um, Senator Boozman and Durbin joined that, bringing the number of bipartisan co-sponsors to 10 in the Senate. Uh, and Boozman is a great addition, as well as Senator Durbin. They're both highly respected members of the Senate. So we are seeing that momentum continuing. And it really is an important step towards, you know, having this conversation about lowering how we lower global emissions. We still hold out hope that a House version will be introduced in the near term. As I said, there's been a little um, disarray over on the House side that really impacted um, things getting introduced in timelines. Um, and so we will wait and see that could, I, I, I would not anticipate seeing prove it introduced before there's a new speaker of the house. So once they, once they get their act together there, maybe we will see uh, prove it introduced. Fair enough. Um, so speaking of disarray, there are two, two questions that kind of talk about that. So a question from James is saying, um, the house is so dysfunctional in terms of rhetoric and partisan excesses. What are the chances anything at all can happen? Uh, and then Josh is asking, how much does our agenda uh, depend on who is the next speaker? Uh, if, uh, if it's Jordan and he's further right, does that put our agenda at risk? So can you just talk a little bit about the sort of the, I guess, political dynamics and how that uh, how that may affect what we're trying to do or does it affect what we're trying to do? You know what? We have to keep doing what we do. It's, it almost makes our work more, uh, more important than ever. But one of the things I took away from the, the deal to keep the government open for the last 45 days, there was a large bipartisan majority that actually did come together to get that package approved. It moved unanimously through the Senate um, and both Democrats and Republicans voted for it in large numbers to move it forward in the House. That's bipartisan cooperation. Now, mind you, those that did not want to move forward had the ability to oust Speaker McCarthy, um, but they are a relatively small minority of the House. And so I think there is, there's, this has even facilitated some more bipartisan conversations. And I think really, opens up an opportunity for once 
once they figure out who the speaker is, they're going to have to figure out a package to fund government, and that package is going to be bipartisan. There's going to be further bipartisan cooperation to keep the government funded for the rest of the fiscal year. And part of that, I think there will be a lot of um, bipartisan deal making and some opportunities for climate wins. So I think, yeah, I think there's a really good opportunity. And this is why I think the timing of our lobby day is perfect. We're going to be talking to Congress when they're making decisions early in November. Uh, be, and then on, because they have to have something ready by November 17th, it might, it might be another short-term CR, you know, to give themselves 10 more days to work. But they're, the end of the year is when these bipartisan deals are going to be happening and will be right on time to deliver a really strong message that this is the time to get some of these important wins for permitting done and potentially some other um, secondary asks that we um, will be talking about uh, in the coming weeks. Awesome. All right. Um, our next most upvoted question is from John and Melissa. We have a joint person logging in. Um, the question says, the Energy Innovation Act seems to have almost no co-sponsors this congressional session. Last session, it had near 100. What has changed? So I, I, I should reiterate that we talked a little bit about this on the introductory call. Congressman Carl, we're in a different congressional place than we were last Congress. Last Congress, Democrats had control of the House, the Senate, the White House. Um, getting as many co-sponsors, even if they were just from one party, was really important to help keep carbon pricing at the forefront of the conversation around the big climate package that ended up becoming the IRA bill. And it really was in there. And so it made sense to just have as many co-sponsors as possible. Right now, we're in a place of divided government where anything is truly going to need to be bipartisan to advance. Congressman Carbajal wants to hold the door shut, for lack of a better thing, to getting a bunch of co-sponsors. He's not taking co-sponsors right now. Um, so he can hold open that space to have conversations with Republicans about the bill and not make it overly partisan. And that might change at some point if the dynamics change. But right now, uh, it has nothing to do with those almost 100 co-sponsors no longer supporting the bill. Um, they still do, and that we still wanted to remind them. That's why we ask you guys to make calls and send emails to remind them that CCL and grassroots climate activists still support a carbon price, but they're just gonna hold those numbers down. Expect the same thing um, with big wires. Um, and just because you don't see co-sponsors on any bill, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't mean there's not support uh, across the aisle or with one particular party. Sometimes it's just a, a tactical thinking of the member to hold down that co-sponsor list, list, but it, that can change, um, but that's where we are right now. Got it. Um, okay, our next question is from John asking about uh, the farm bill, which has been any comment on the farm bill. So um, I know we're have an eye on that for next year. Can you just talk a little bit about, uh, about that and opportunities we might see there? Yeah, no, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And we will get into some of this when I think about our November lobby day, especially with secondary asks, because the Farm Bill also expired um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it doesn't have as immediate repercussions. Some of this stuff will start to hit, but they will need to extend the Farm Bill as well. And the thing up here is because they really didn't get enough done on it, that this is going to be something they're going to be working and focused on in the spring. And in my ideal perfect world, because there's not like, um, we, we have all have limited bandwidth, is we get big permanent wins now at the end of this Congress, and then we can pivot to greater focus on the farm bill in the spring, because it only happens once every five years or so. And But there will be a lot of opportunities. We're already seeing a lot of good signs. Some of our supporting asks um, are specific things around healthy forests that are really designed and intended to be looped into the farm bill. There will be some more things coming and that people hope to include in the farm bill, but there's really a renewed focus on using agriculture and natural climate solutions is pretty popular and has bipartisan support. Um, and so we really think there's going to be some big climate wins, but we will see a lot more from us talking about this, what those could be and where we'll focus our energy. Awesome, all right. Um, we've got a, we'll take a couple more questions here before we wrap up. So um, this is a question from George asking, is there anything climate or energy related in the National Defense Authorization Act process uh, that we should be thinking about? 
Well, there there are a couple things. There were there was some not so good things in the house version, but we know that's not going to be the version that advances. There's nothing that is there's still the possibility that some climate things come together in the bigger package. The NDAA is always a a big vehicle for trying to move things because it's a must pass bill. So there could, it still could be a place where we see bigger climate priorities. There was a um, nuclear bill, the Advance Act, um, that was included in the Senate version of the NDAA. Um, so that could be something that's in there. Um, and that, that could also be another place where things are done around permitting reform. There could be other riders slipped in there. I mean, most likely things are going to be on appropriations, but the NDA is always something and we'll be keeping an eye on it. Gotcha. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that everybody should come to the trainings that you and Jen do <laughs> over the next few weeks to stay uh, as updated as possible about all this different stuff that's going on. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll have a lot of good stuff to share. All right. Well, our last uh, last question here um, from Mindy is: How do people sign up to lobby? Should they talk to their talk to their liaisons? Is there more of a process than that? Probably <laughs> your liaisons are a good place to start. Your regional coordinators, your state coordinators. Um, I, the, that is that is that is where to go for sure. All right. And the lobbying. Um, anything else you want to say about about because um, the lobbying is happening the week after our fall conference. Um, November 4th. So um, one thing, I mean, the one thing I'll say about our lobby is like, we really want people as much as possible to focus on getting meetings that week. Um, because one thing we know a lot of things are going to be happening. And sometimes like virtual lobbying can get kind of a little bit more spread out. But we're most impactful when we speak with one voice at one specific time, we really see that. And one thing you'll see um, and we'll talk about in trainings, is we, we try to adapt. We try to learn from what we're doing and see what's being effective. And one thing we saw in June is we had too many secondary asks. So we did not have as great an impact as we have had previously when we were all making just a few asks and we would see big bumps in co-sponsors and really help some of those bills like um, the Growing Climate Solutions Act, the BEST Act, to use that. Get the, we got those things over the finish line by having more focus. And so what one thing you'll see um, in, for this lobby day is we're really going to try to tighten things up and have a much more focused approach. Um, it's not because these other things are not important anymore. We're just going to try to be the most impactful, learn the lessons from previous lobby days. And um, and that's that's the thing you can expect to see um, from us in the, the trainings coming up. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. That's all the time we have for questions. So I'll pass it back over to Ellie. Thank Thanks, you. Ben. Yeah, thank you both. I loved how you concluded that, Ben. I just like felt a stirring of patriotism and sort of a sense of a place in history as you were describing the successes we've had with our, especially with our supporting asks. So I don't know if anyone else felt that, but I certainly sat up a little straighter and waved my flag a little brighter. Well, thank you all for your wonderful questions. And remember, if you have questions that you asked but weren't addressed, or if you have other questions that come up, you certainly can post them in the forums on CCL community and join Ben and Jen for the trainings in the coming weeks. If you haven't yet let us know in the chat how what chapter you represent and how many are in the room with you, we'd love for you to do that in the chat before we uh, officially wrap up. Uh, I want to say thank you to Ben for all of his insights and thank you for Debbie for sharing her advice and her experience. And thanks to all of you for being here for this month's meeting and we will see you on November 4th.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.